Blacks in the Leo Frank Case Several black men and women were in some way involved in the events surrounding the murder of Mary Fagan. Their testimonies were often key to establishing the state's case against Leo Frank, as they often conflicted with some aspect of Frank's alibi. Several more blacks were drawn into the case during the appeals process to overturn Frank's murder conviction. For many, their lives were severely disrupted and permanently altered through their connection to the case. Aaron Allen A, quote, Negro stool pigeon, end quote, who, early in the investigation of Mary Fagan's murder, was employed by the police detectives to stay in the jail cell and coax a confession from Newt Lee, was paid $15 by Frank's agents to swear Conley had confessed to him. Gordon Bailey Snowball National Pencil Company elevator operator arrested April 28th and jailed for at least three weeks. Friend of James Conley as a sworn, quote, colored, end quote, witness for the defendant, he testified at trial. Emma Beard The maid of Frank's assistant, Herbert Schiff. She testified about Schiff's actions on the day of the murder. Bell Quote, Negro detective, end quote, employed by William J. Burns. Annie Maud Carter, jail, quote, trustee, end quote, who was asked by a friend of Frank's to put poison in Conley's food. She declined. Burns hired her to try to frame Conley with a set of forged letters falsely attributed to Conley. James Jim Conley, a, quote, sweeper, end quote, and former elevator operator at the National Pencil Company who testified that, on the day of the murder, he was ordered by his employer, Leo Frank, to move the dead body of Mary Fagan from the second floor to the basement, to write notes to divert suspicion from the murderer, Leo Frank, and to burn the body in the factory furnace. Will Green It was claimed, falsely, by the defense that Green was, quote, shooting craps, end quote with Conley in the basement of the factory on the day of the murder, and that he may have been a witness or participant in the crime. He was said to have left town as a circus employee shortly after the murder. Annie Hickson The maid of Frank's brother-in-law, Charles Ersenbach. She received the call from Frank on the day of the murder, canceling his and Ersenbach's plans to go to a baseball game. She testified that Frank was in the Urson box home the day after the murder, quote, just laughing and talking like they always do, end quote. Charles A. Isom Hired by William J. Burns' agents for $3 a day to find blacks who worked at the factory next door to the National Pencil Company to say they had heard screams coming from the basement. Ivy Jones testified that Conley was not drunk on the day of the murder, said his affidavit to the contrary was forged. Newt Lee, National Pencil Company night watchman who discovered the body of Mary Fagan in the factory basement on the last of his hourly rounds. He was implicitly named in the murder notes, and thus he was the first person to be suspected of the crime. He was arrested early Sunday morning, April 27th. Truman McCrary, Drayman who was at the factory three times on the day of the murder. Albert McKnight, husband of Manola McKnight, revealed to his employers what his wife had told him about Frank's confession to the murder of Mary Fagan. He also disputed Frank's version of what he did when he came home for lunch on the day of the murder. Manola McKnight, 20-year-old, quote, Negro servant girl, end quote, working in the home of Leo Frank. She told her husband, Albert, and later swore to police that she had overheard Frank's wife say on the night of the murder that an intoxicated and suicidal Leo Frank confessed to killing Mary Fagan. Fred Perkerson Paid by Frank's detective, William J. Burns, to get a confession from Conley. $15 
Arthur Pride, employee of the National Pencil Company who testified about his financial dealings with James Conley. Frank Reese, paid by Frank's detective William J. Burns to get a confession from Conley. Seen often with Burns' agent Jimmy Wren. Mary Rich, operated a lunch stand near the factory and was approached by Frank's wife and his spiritual leader, Rabbi Marks, and asked to sign a false affidavit implicating James Conley. She refused, but the false affidavit was forged and submitted anyway. Mark Wilson, was said to have seen Conley buy food from Mary Rich, who denied the story as fiction. Blacks tortured for Frank's sins. Quote, I could shoot you through the bars of your cell right now. End quote. A friend of Leo Frank's to James Conley. The mistreatment of blacks who were connected in some way to the case has gone mostly unexamined. After Mary Fagan, whose life was cut short and who endured exploitation and victimization at the hands of her employer, it was the blacks who bore the most abuse in the Leo Frank affair. The many violations of civil and human rights in the two-year-long case were suffered in large part by blacks alone. White witnesses were interviewed, but black witnesses were said to have been, quote, sweated, end quote, or subjected to the, quote, third degree, end quote, a term defined as, quote, the inflicting of pain, physical or mental, to extract confessions or statements, end quote. Gordon Bailey was the young black elevator operator in the factory, and he was arrested two days after the murder, along with Newt Lee, James Gant, and Arthur Mullinax. He was kept under arrest for at least three weeks and, according to one report, was put through a, quote, grueling interrogation, end quote. When the black night watchman was arrested, police handcuffed him to a chair and threatened him with a lynching. Dinnerstein wrote, quote, The police allegedly tortured him mercilessly, end quote. Indeed, sleep deprivation was one of the methods described by Newt Lee in his testimony. Lindemann added that Lee suffered the, quote, common practice, end quote, for black suspects of being, quote, browbeaten and roughed up by the police to extract a confession, end quote. Frank himself stated in court that Lee, quote, shrieked and cried, end quote, upon receiving the, quote, third degree, end quote, and Frank's own attorney addressed this in the courtroom. Quote, there were things you, end quote, detectives, quote, did to him for which you will never be forgiven. You persecuted the old nigger, end quote. But Frank was never treated in this way. In fact, as a suspect held in prison, Frank aided in Lee's interrogation. Even with this, quote, official, end quote, abuse, it was claimed that Newt Lee actually preferred to remain in the custody of the police, in part because he had been harassed by Jewish supporters of Frank and feared for his life. Lee was not released from his ordeal until after Frank's sentencing. James Conley's lawyer, William M. Smith, informed the court that Frank's supporters made extraordinary efforts to force a confession from Conley. Burns agent Annie Maud Carter, months later, testified that the friends of Leo Frank had tried to poison Conley. Smith told the court that Conley's life was in danger and that he had to be moved from his cell. Quote, Conley had asked to be taken away from the tower to escape the harassments of the visitors of Leo Frank, declaring that they stopped at his cell and tried to make him drink liquor and had tried to intimidate him by making jeering remarks to him and implying threats. I could shoot you through the bars of your cell right now, and don't you think you ought to be shot? Are some of the statements visitors are quoted as making. End quote. Conley's lawyer had to petition the court to permit his client to bathe, but Frank's attorney, Reuben Arnold, protested. <laughs> 
Quote, I understand they want to give him a bath. If Mr. Smith wants to give him a bath, let him do it. Let him turn the hose on him if he wants to. End quote. Talk of this type about Frank, the accused murderer, would never have been countenanced. A private agent, hired by Frank, had locked Conley in a six by eight foot, quote, sweat box, end quote, in the police station, with a newspaper reporter stationed in the hallway recording the illegal interrogation. Dorsey said the agent and police detectives, quote, bored, end quote, him, and subjected him to a, quote, strenuous third degree, end quote. And Golden says the grilling included, quote, beating him, end quote. And just as Southern newspapers would pre-announce the time and place of an illegal lynching, an Atlanta Constitution headline announced in advance that, quote, Negro will be subjected to another third degree today, end quote. Leo Frank escaped those harsh interrogation methods, even though the whites that had him in custody believed him guilty of the rape and murder of Mary Fagan. In fact, at the trial he later claimed was unfair to him, Leo Frank did not even have to suffer cross-examination or any uncomfortable questioning at all. Blacks were subjected to yet another layer of abuse and intimidation, a psychological assault, when they were referred to in open court by Frank's lawyers as, quote, colored, end quote, or, quote, nigger, end quote, or, quote, darky, end quote. And the newspapers followed suit. No such bigoted, anti-ethnic, racist language was ever applied to Jews, in or out of court. Still, outside the jailhouse, violence befell blacks who had tendered evidence of Frank's guilt. In a mysterious attack, Frank's cook, Manola McKnight, was knifed across her face and was left with a five-inch wound. She would not reveal her assailant, if she knew, but the attack was suspected of being related to her damaging testimony in the Leo Frank case. Her husband, Albert, was in Frank's home on the afternoon of the murder and provided an account of Frank's movements that conflicted with Frank's alibi. McKnight sustained serious internal injuries, a gash to his head and bruises in an incident on the train tracks involving him and Atlanta police detectives, a circumstance for which we have only the police account. Albert McKnight had been previously threatened with bodily harm. A detective working for Leo Frank had promised Albert his help in finding a job as a Pullman porter if he would renounce his previous unfavorable testimony. If he refused, quote, the Jews would get him, end quote. Albert then repudiated his repudiation and claimed his original statement that damaged Frank's alibi was the truth. In doing so, he voluntarily asked to be placed in the protective custody of the police. Leo Frank himself commented on the incident. Quote, Is it not passing strange that a Negro, of his own volition, desire to be locked up in the station house? I venture the assertion that in the annals of police history, no Negro has ever made such a demand. Is it not remarkable that a Negro should try to break into jail? End quote. This action by McKnight is more of a commentary on the level of threats, intimidation, and violence by Frank's small army of mercenaries and operatives, a veritable lynch mob that, on Leo Frank's behalf, actually scared black people into jail. At the time of Leo Frank's trial, that kind of violence accompanied every aspect of black life in America. The mistreatment of blacks, connected by circumstance to the fate of Leo Frank, is especially disturbing, both in its occurrence and in its disregard by scholars of the case. The Cross-Examination of Leo Frank Quote, Frank is a man of marvelous memory for details, end quote, and, quote, very methodical, end quote. William J. Burns, famous detective hired by Leo Frank. Quote, he, end quote, Leo Frank, quote, 
was unduly anxious. He told contradictory stories. End quote. Steve Oney. Nagging questions, devious lies. Today's believers in the innocence of Leo Frank have continued the tactic pursued in the courtroom by his lawyers, who assigned all manner of dishonesty to James Conley. Frank's attorneys variously called Conley, quote, a dirty, filthy, black, drunken, lying nigger, end quote. Quote, a dirty Negro crook, end quote. A, quote, beastly, drunken, filthy, lying nigger, end quote. A, quote, filthy, criminal, lying negro, end quote. Being careful to pair untruthfulness and uncleanliness with the black race. Frank's attorney, Reuben Arnold, summarized his client's defense. Quote, If there is one thing for which a Negro is capable, it is for telling a story in detail. It is the same with children. Both have vivid imaginations. And a Negro is also the best mimic in the world. End quote. Frank's folksy lead advocate, Luther Rosser, added, Quote, if you put a nigger in a hopper, he'll drip lies. His whole intelligence trends in that direction. End quote. All that racial bluster simply camouflaged the fact that several significant falsehoods, lies, and deceptions led Leo Frank to his ignominious downfall, starting with his account of his actions on the day of the murder. In fact, Frank has been found to have lied about at least a dozen significant aspects of the case including his movements on April 26, 1913, his familiarity with the murder victim, his relationship with his young female employees, and many other key points. From the moment police first contacted him on the day the body was discovered, Frank seemed to drip lies. If we step off the well-worn paths laid out by Frank's partisans and engage in a critical study of the affair, our examination uncovers significant new detail unwittingly overlooked or purposely ignored. These underappreciated, quote, strands, end quote, of evidence demand a fresh analysis to determine whether they do indeed create a rope strong enough to uphold the conviction of Leo Frank. Alibi under fire. Quote, I was in my office, end quote. It was established by Leo Frank's own testimony that, on the last day of her life, Saturday, April 26, 1913, Mary Fagan was in his office on the second floor of the National Pencil Company, quote, shortly after 12 o'clock, end quote. Frank emphatically asserted to police that he was in his office continuously between 12 noon and 12.45 p.m. He said, quote, now, gentlemen, to the best of my recollection, from the time the whistle blew for 12 o'clock until after a quarter to one, to the best of my recollection, I did not stir out of the inner office. End quote. He paid Mary her $1.20 in wages, and then she left. He had no idea what happened to Mary after that, only that he remained in his office working for the next 40 minutes. That was his alibi, he was, quote, positive, end quote, about it, and he was sticking to it. But a week after the murder, a 14-year-old factory worker named Montine Stover emerged to say that on the day of the murder, she sat alone in Frank's office, waiting for her paycheck for a full five minutes, from 12.05 to 12.10. She went into both his inner and outer offices, but did not find Frank anywhere. After waiting five minutes, she left. When Frank became aware of Stover's explosive testimony, he modified his formerly definitive statement thus. Quote, but it is possible that, in order to answer a call of nature or to urinate, I may have gone to the toilet. Those are things that a man does unconsciously and cannot tell how many times, nor when he does it. End quote. 
Several things about Frank's new explanation are inconsistent logically, mathematically, and anatomically. Frank specifically refers to the bodily function of urination as an essential part of his new alibi. But the biomechanics of that act itself are incongruent with Frank's new claims, and may actually implicate him more deeply. In the adult, the volume of urine in the bladder that normally initiates a reflex contraction is about 300 to 400 milliliters, or approximately 10 to 13.5 ounces, the amount in a can of soda. The average urine flow rate for males is 21 milliliters per second. This amounts to approximately 20 seconds for an average male to urinate. The toilet in the rear of the National Pencil Company's second floor is 225 feet from Frank's office. That makes a round trip of 450 feet, at 4.42 feet per second, average male walking speed, a total of 102 seconds to and fro, with a few, quote, unconscious, end quote, seconds for flushing, washing of hands, etc., the entire, quote, unconscious, end quote, act should have taken just about two minutes and ten seconds, far less than the five minutes Stover waited. See diagram. Further, as much as 280 feet, 63 seconds, of that, quote, unconscious, end quote, walk would have been within earshot and view of Montine Stover, who was sitting in Frank's empty office in the, quote, still and quiet, end quote, factory, listening and looking for Frank's return. She actually walked 140 feet, more than halfway to the bathroom, to the door of the metal room, and, finding it closed and the floor apparently deserted, left the factory. Then there is the brazen irresponsibility of, quote, unconsciously, end quote, leaving the office unattended. It is an act that is difficult to ascribe to a conscientious and fastidious factory manager, such as Leo Frank. Montine Stover testified that the door leading to the rear area of the floor was closed. Frank would never have left his two office doors wide open and accessible to unknown factory traffic, but then close the metal room door, which further isolates him from potential activity, to go to the toilet on the opposite side of the building. This would have to have been a very conscious act, given that the very security of his office was at stake. Frank then added a second alibi option that raises even more questions than it answers. Frank claimed that he was at his inner office desk when Montine Stover arrived, but that she did not notice him. He says very carefully, quote, Now, sitting in my office at my desk, it is impossible for me to see out into the outer hall when the safe door is open, as it was that morning. And not only is it impossible for me to see out, but it is impossible for people to see in and see me there. End quote. Frank's explanation should have been alarming to the shareholders of the National Pencil Company, since he was admitting that he had configured his office to allow strangers direct access to the company treasure without his observation. In answer to a direct question put to him at the coroner's inquest about who was in the outer office at the time of Mary's arrival, Frank answered, quote, I don't know, end quote. And one might infer that this circumstance regularly occurred, a state of affairs that effectively defeats the very purpose of a safe. Mr. James Gant had been fired by Frank for allegedly miscounting a couple of dollars, yet Gant had not made the safe vulnerable to thieves, as had his boss, Leo Frank. Montine Stover was very clear about what she did that day, and she was far more sure of her actions than was Frank. Quote, I went through the first office into the second office, end quote. And she specifically said that she did not notice the safe. At the trial, Frank's lawyers presented photographs of the inner office showing the door of the safe in the outer office in a position that blocked the view of Frank's desk. The prosecution attorney wisely solicited from the photographer that the office furniture may have been, quote, rearranged, end quote, in the many weeks between the murder and the photo shoot. End 
Whereas the act of urinating might be considered a reflexive and even unconscious activity, the procedures that Frank had to go through to secure his office and the safe and travel 225 feet away required absolute consciousness. Frank was conscious of the fact that the factory's front door to the street was open. Mary Fagan and several others had entered the factory unhindered, and that there were other employees in the building, including, quote, Negroes, end quote, whom he believed to be natural thieves. He said that he had heard, quote, a girl's or woman's voice, end quote, directly after Mary Fagan had left his office, but he could not identify the voice and did not feel the need to try. He testified that he knew, quote, that the employees would be coming in for their pay envelopes, end quote. So, quote, I had them all in the cash basket beside me to save walking to the safe each time, end quote. Thus, there was no reason for the safe to be open at all. Nonetheless, Frank's fiduciary and security obligations, closing and locking a safe and securing a basket filled with cash payments, to leave the office to relieve himself at a critical layer of responsibility that cannot be claimed as an, quote, unconscious, end quote, reflex action. Still, Frank's admission that he may have made an, quote, unconscious, end quote, trip to the toilet between 12.05 and 12.10 may actually have been an, quote, unconscious, end quote, confession to the murder of Mary Fagan. The physical blood and hair evidence of the murder was found in the rear metal room area of the second floor en route to the toilet, and medical testimony showed that the murder occurred shortly after Mary's arrival shortly after noon. By Frank's own account of his own, quote, unconscious, end quote, actions on that day, he places himself exactly where the murder occurred, exactly when the murder occurred. The Immaculate Visit Lemmy Quinn Just Misses a Murder Leo Frank held on tight to his claim that he never left his office between 12 noon and, quote, a quarter to one, end quote. But when Montine Stover came forward a week later to reveal her visit to an empty office, he had to quickly revise his alibi. A full 10 days after the murder and after several interrogations, Frank suddenly remembered that at 12.20 p.m. he had been visited in his office by a factory foreman named Lemmy Quinn. He had stepped into Frank's office and exchanged greetings for less than two minutes before leaving the factory. If this visit actually occurred, it would have placed Frank in his office after Montine Stover's office visit and at the very time that prosecutors estimated the murder had occurred. Frank revealed this alleged visit while under oath at the coroner's inquest on May 5th, when the incredulous coroner asked, quote, How could you forget such a thing? End quote. Frank claimed it had simply, quote, slipped his mind. End quote. Quote, this is the first time I recollected the incident. I had not thought of it until reminded of the incident. My memory was refreshed. I recollected it clearly. This is the first time I have made it known. End quote. Many Atlantans were as skeptical as the coroner, for this remembered visit to neatly emerged just as his previous alibi suffered a serious challenge. Many Atlantans suspected that Quinn had been bribed to tell this tale, a suggestion that, quote, outraged, end quote, Quinn, who offered to, quote, whip, end quote, his accusers. As would later come to light, Frank's hired agents and supporters did indeed bribe, threaten, and invent witnesses without reservation or restraint. And the more the alleged Quinn visit is examined, the more it appears to fall into the category of testimony for hire. When first questioned by police about his movements on the day of the murder, Lemmy Quinn denied being in the factory at all. He then admitted his presence but estimated his arrival time as between 12 o'clock and 12.20 p.m. Later, he admitted under oath that he, quote, couldn't say exactly what time it was, end quote. And then his reason for actually coming to the factory on his day off changed over time. At first, he told the coroner that, quote, 
I wanted to see Frank and tell him how do. I knew he would be in the place. He is always there on Saturdays. End quote. But at trial, three months later, a new reason emerged. Quote, I went to the factory on April 26th to see Mr. Schiff. He was not there. End quote. Quinn says he stayed with Frank only a couple of minutes and then left and met up with other factory workers. But two other co-workers testified they saw Quinn at a cafe near the factory just after 11.45 a.m., 35 minutes before the time claimed by Frank and Quinn and well before Mary Fagan's arrival at 12.03 p.m. The two young women both testified that Quinn told them that he had just been up to see Frank. Frank himself let slip an unintended verification of the women's testimony when he told the coroner that Quinn had greeted him with a hearty, quote, good morning, end quote. And then there is Quinn's demeanor that raised the detective's suspicion. Frank's own hired investigators from the Pinkerton Detective Agency further interrogated Quinn on his alleged visit to Frank's office and commented, quote, The statement was made readily enough, but that part relative to Quinn's having gone to the factory about 12.20 or 12.25 p.m. was halting and lame, given in a manner that might denote that Quinn did not care to commit himself. This manner was also apparent, even stronger, when questioned as to his conversation at the Coleman home, and also his conversation with Mr. Frank on Thursday, May 1st, end quote. When, quote, Quinn reminded Frank, end quote, about the April 26th visit to the factory. Quinn acted strangely when paying respect at the home of Mary Fagan's mother and stepfather. The Colemans interpreted Quinn's abrupt departure as, quote, a manifestation of fear, end quote, at having to meet Mr. Coleman. Further, Quinn continued to act on behalf of the Frank defense when he dropped a rumor casting suspicion on James Conley. According to the Pinkerton report of May 17th, Foreman Quinn stated that on two occasions, complaints had come to him from two girl employees of the factory that Conley had been too familiar in his talk. Again, no previous mention of this lynchable offense had ever arisen, and no subsequent testimony backed up that allegation. Most damning are the words Quinn shared with reporters on his way out of the coroner's inquest on May 6th. As has been discussed, the arrest of James Conley on May 1st may have been engineered by Frank's defense team to keep him from being questioned at the inquest. Quinn seemed to be participating in the plot to conceal Conley when he made this strange statement to the Atlanta Constitution reporter. Quote, As I came downstairs on the way out, I saw someone in the rear of the first floor, a person whom I would have no grounds whatever to suspect. End quote. He went on to say, quote, No, I won't divulge his name. I'll tell the detectives in time. End quote. The unintentional consequence of Quinn's dubious visit was that it undermined Frank's theory of the crime. By the time of the trial, Frank's lawyers had advanced the notion that Conley alone murdered Mary Fagan. They insisted that it was he who sat in the shadows of the first floor and pounced on the girl as she walked down the stairs from Frank's office at about 12.10. He then dragged her down into the basement, where he further strangled her, wrote notes to place near the body, and then exited through the basement door. If Quinn had left when he claimed, at 12.25, and, quote, saw someone in the rear of the first floor, a person whom I would have no grounds whatever to suspect, end quote. Then Quinn, in trying to establish an alibi for Frank, actually destroys Frank's theory of the crime. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3. The Leo Frank Case, The Lynching of a Guilty Man prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. Published in audiobook form by the American Mercury with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam.